This weekend, I went to the 40th Scottish Festival and Highland Games at Thanksgiving Point. Not only was it a fantastic excuse to wear my kilt, but I was able to wear it without anyone else staring at me because, well, everyone else was in one too. It's nice to be able to wear it and not stick out. We got to watch a bunch of the Highland Games. These included the weight throw, which was essentially big burly men trying to throw this heavy ball on chain as far as they could without hurting themselves. Or with, probably. The sheaf toss was probably my favorite. Competitors speared a 20 pound bundle of straw with a pitchfork and tried to toss it over a high bar. Over. And over. And over. Yeah! It's kind of like trying to get the conversion during a rugby match. Or extreme farming. Probably more like extreme farming than anything. During these games, two world records were broken and one North American record was also broken. We saw history being made. Yes! There were plenty of pipers and pipe bands to go along with everything. The clarion call of the bagpipes could be heard throughout the whole event. And then there was the haggis. Basically, haggis is sheep's pluck, or in other words, the sheep's heart, liver, and lungs, minced with onion, suey, spices, and salt, all served within the stomach of an animal. Unfortunately, the modern day haggis is usually prepared in a sausage casing instead of a stomach. How unfortunate. I wanted the stomach. Meatballs and armpits. <laughs> Basically, the Scottish festival was fantastic. I love everything Scotland, so this is pretty much heaven, or as close to it until I can actually get back to Scotland. I'm a Canadian living in the United States who thinks I'm pure-blood Scottish. I have problems. Speaking of Scotland, let me explain a little bit more on the Battle of Bannockburn, which I mentioned just briefly in my last video. The Scottish had been struggling against the English for independence since the year 1296, and the English were at first successful in their attempts at conquering the Scots in that year. In 1306, however, Robert the Bruce of Scotland seized the Scottish throne and the War of Independence was back in business. Edward II of England came to the throne in 1307, so he was the one that had the privilege of fighting back the Scots. The Stirling Castle in England was besieged in 1314 by Robert the Bruce's brother, and this just couldn't be ignored by the English. The English gathered her army, which totaled about 2,000 cavalry and 15,000 infantry, many of which were longbowmen. The total number of the Scottish army numbered between 7,000 and 10,000 men, of which only about 500 would have been on horseback. Compared to the heavily armored English cavalry, the Scottish mounts would have been fairly armorless. The estimate number of men on the English side were guessed to be about two or three times as large as the army of Robert the Bruce. Medieval battles usually only lasted a few hours, but this one lasted a good two days. The Battle of Bannockburn began on June 24, 1314, 700 years ago. On the first day, Robert the Bruce engaged in single combat with Henry de Bohun, Earl of Hereford. Bohun charged Bruce, and when they came side by side, Bruce took his axe and opened up his opponent's head. The Scots then charged the English, forcing them back. The English tried to regroup and flank the Scots, but the Scots wouldn't break formation, and the English withdrew, plenty confused. That night, the English crossed the stream known as the Bannock Burn and set up their position behind it. A Scottish king, Alexander Seton, who was at that time fighting for and in the service of King Edward II, deserted the English, came to Bruce and told him of the low morale of the English. After losing a battle while outnumbering your opponent by at least double would do that to a soldier. So Bruce attacked. The English archers should have been able to put a stop to the advance, but a Scottish cavalry charge neutralized the archers. An English charge was then led by the Earl of Gloucester, but Gloucester may have done so unwillingly, since he was goaded into doing so by the king after the king called him a coward for suggesting the battle be postponed. Not a lot of men followed Gloucester into his charge, and he was soon surrounded and killed. The English soon became aware that they had lost, and needed to get the heck out, but one of Edward's knights, Gillies de Argentine, claimed he wasn't used to running away, and thus made one final charge. He and his men died on the Scottish spears. King Edward ran away with his personal bodyguard, and the rest of his army fell into chaos. The Scots routed the army, and not even a third of Edward's army was able to retreat back to England. The losses on the Scottish side appeared to be quite light. Quite impressive considering how badly they were outnumbered. So there you go. Now when you wish people a happy 700th anniversary of the Battle of Bannockburn, you can explain to them what that even means. Alba Gubra. <laughs>